now moving into the brave world of a hybrid panel session, um, which I'm sure will improve our well-being immensely um, because we're not at Microsoft. And um, uh, it's going to be moderated uh, here in real life by uh, Naomi, Naomi Clymer. Uh, incidentally, Lucy talked about walking past uh, a gallery of men who had been presidents of the IET, one of the two women who have been presidents of the IET who's, uh, and whose picture is up there punctuating all the men, his name is. Um, uh, <laughs> and she is a chair and co-founder of the Institute for the Future of Work. And she's joined by a great panel. Um, remotely, Darren is there somewhere uh, from the MIT. Um, and, you know, his face will magically appear, or his voice. We have his voice. Can we have his picture as well, do you think? Uh, it's coming. <laughs> um, uh, Kirsty Blackman. Hey. Yay. Hello. Hello. Lovely to see you. Um, or, or hello that way. Um, uh, Kirsty Blackman, Member of Parliament from Aberdeen. Um, Shadow uh, Cabinet Office um, uh, from the Scottish Nationalist Party. Um, you're very welcome. Uh, and John Evans, um, a luxuriating in his retirement from um, solving lots of problems in the trade union world. Um, and they're uh, going to talk to us uh, and talk to each other and engage with us around uh, issues around how we take advantage of the opportunities of uh, the transformation created by technology in a way that is equitable uh, and works for everyone. Naomi, over to you. Thank you, Jim. Well, thanks for coming back. Uh, it's good to see so many of you. And um, you've, you've heard about my stellar <coughs> panel. And thank you, Dan, for joining us um, from MIT. Um, and you probably gathered that I'm an engineer by profession. And um, the reason I'm here is because I believe there's a real opportunity to introduce tech into the workplace in a way that makes work better and fairer. Um, and uh, at the same time, improving company bottom lines. Uh, and I think we can do that, but on the whole, that's not entirely the experience that we're having so far. Um, in an earlier session, um, Eric was talking about how 90% of a, um, a tech implementation is about things that aren't actually the tech, things around it, like uh, complementary things and the organization, things like um, uh, upskilling the workforce, uh, which I wholeheartedly agree with. And we, there are plenty of... Uh, difficult examples which have come out in the Q&A this morning of tech making work worse. Uh, things like the loss of autonomy, um, just the loss of jobs generally, uh, deterioration in mental health. There's quite a few bad examples, but there are some really great examples of where it has made a difference. And someone this morning mentioned the idea that medicine could become a craft if all of the kind of routine process stuff was taken away, that it would become more creative and more of a craft. Somebody else mentioned green jobs. Uh, and, and one of the things I read this week, which I thought was rather delicious, which is the workers taking on automation themselves, was the idea that they're beginning to use um, chat GPT to, uh, to write their uh, cover letters for job applications for them. So even the workers are automating. Um, so there, there's real potential for technology to be used in ways that frees people up and makes life better. Um, so this panel is going to talk about the impact of, of technology on work, uh, its impact on firms and on the workers, and how policies in particular could help to make sure that the tech adoption uh, encourages good work. Um, so. Uh, I'm going to ask Darren to speak first, and then I'm going to ask Kirsty and then John. So we'll get some introductory remarks, and then we'll go to Q&A. So do get onto Slido and submit your questions, uh, and hopefully we'll work through as many of those as we can. So, uh, Darren, could I um, welcome you and ask you to take the floor? Wonderful. Thank you very much, Naomi, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm going to share my slides as well. Uh, but while I'm doing that, let me <laughs> say it's a true pleasure uh, because these are very important topics close to my heart. And also, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's fantastic to be part of the Pisaridas Review since Chris Pisaridas was my teacher and inspiration. And uh, our paths have crossed many times since I left the LSE in 1993. But uh, 
it's uh, it's also a pleasure that over the last decade or so, we have both been thinking about the issues that are central for the future of work from different angles, complementary angles. What I want to do is actually provide a little bit of a framework for a more rigorous thinking about the future of work, which will end up throwing some cold water on some of the more optimistic claims about the role of technology, digital technologies. But I'll focus on AI because that's been the flavor of the month and 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 plays a central role in the more optimistic accounts of how we can leverage digital technologies for the future of work. Uh, you know, there's a lot of <clears throat> apprehension about AI, uh, but many experts agree that there have been major advances that are just the tip of the iceberg, and AI is becoming more broadly applicable, not just chat GPT, but if you look at AI-related publications, they have shifted from computer science journals to a much broader range of application domains. And a lot of optimism, uh, especially from some of the very high-profile places like The Economist magazine in a recent issue uh, takes those like me who uh, are less optimistic about AI to task uh, stating by lowering costs of production, AI-based automation can create more demand for goods and services. The economy may need fewer checkout attendants at supermarkets, but not a problem. More massage therapists will make up for that. Or the recent McKinsey Davos statement with fourth industrial revolution, these technologies are going to create more different jobs that are transforming manufacturing, help build fulfilling, rewarding, and sustainable careers. Well, uh, the best data on some of these issues is from the US, and it doesn't look as promising, at least if you look at over the somewhat longer haul of the digital technologies era. So uh, here I'm showing you the uh, real wages of 10 education, 10 demographic groups differentiated by gender and education from 1940s to the late 1970s. Uh, real wages for all of these groups grew in tandem from the fact that you can see all of these curves, at least from 1963 in this picture because of data availability, uh, they're, they're on top of each other. But then from around 1980, you see a sea change and not only a huge amount of inequality building up in the U.S. labor market, but you also can notice the real wages of low education workers, especially men, declining. So high school dropouts, high school graduate, even workers with associate degrees in the United States are doing less well than they did in the 1970s in real wage terms. So what's going on? How do you reconcile this with the canon of economics that suggests that anything that increases productivity, and clearly digital technologies have done that, uh, should ultimately lead to higher wages because they increase labor demand. Well, I think that's actually an important thing, and I want to sort of tax you a little by just showing you why automation, which is one of the main things that many of these digital technologies have been doing is actually a more complex technological implications, has a more complex technological implications than what is generally <clears throat> For that, let me just show you this very simple graph, which says, well, imagine you are trying to minimize costs and you have a bunch of tasks, for example, painting, welding, design, uh, uh, assembly, and so on. And you're going to try to decide which task gets assigned to what factor. And here I have just looked at capital and labor, but you should also, of course, think of different skills within labor. And on the vertical axis, I have the cost of production. Uh, so on, in orange, it's the cost of capital. And not all tasks could be done by capital. Some of them still require labor. So that's why the capital one stops at this threshold I. And then cost minimization is you choose whichever one is the lower, you follow the orange curve, and then you jump onto the green curve. So now, in this picture, I can show you what an increase in worker productivity does, the type of thing that makes economists build their intuition that, you know, technological change is going to be good for workers. So, for instance, if you make workers more productive in across the board, that's going to shift down the cost of 
uh, production by labor. And all of this blue area here becomes productivity increases, which helps the economy, but also makes sure that now employers want more workers because workers have become more productive and that higher labor demand translates into wages. Now, more or less the same thing happens if capital itself becomes more productive. But none of this looks like automation, which is what one of the main issues with AI and with robotics and with other software-based tools in offices, uh, you know, that's one of the main issues that worries people. And if you want to put automation into this framework, it looks very different. In particular, what automation corresponds to is a shift in what is feasible to produce with capital. So that threshold I shifts to I prime. What that does is two very different things than the sort of the standard thinking normally entails. First of all, it has a first order displacement effect. All of the workers that used to perform those tasks that have now been automated have been displaced, some of them into unemployment, some of them into lower wage work, where they go and depress other people's wages as well because they're competing for existing tasks. Second, productivity effects are actually not that great, especially if this orange curve is close to the blue curve, automation is just replacing sort of labor which was doing okay with capital that's doing a little bit better, but that's hardly revolutionary. Pascual Restrepo and I have called this so-so automation, meaning, yeah, you're going to get some benefits, but it's not revolutionary. But the labor demand implications, wage implications are quite important. So here is one take on that. And since time is short, let me just focus on the chart on the, on the, on the right. The one on the left shows that things like this didn't really happen before the 1980s. It's a post-1980 phenomenon. But let me just focus on the right. And what this one does is from a more recent work that I have with Pascual Restrepo, it looks in the U.S. to 500 demographic groups representing different skills. Different colors represent these education groups that I had shown. And for each uh, education group, <clears throat> we estimate how much of the tasks they used to perform in 1980 have been displaced by automation, software, dedicated equipment, and robotics, pre-AI. But, but it's sort of informative. And what you see is that there is a remarkably strong relationship between changes in the real wages of these groups and what this displacement has done. In fact, about 70% of all of the changes in the U.S. wage inequality, the type of changes that I showed you in that first chart, can be explained by this task displacement. So automation has been a major driver of inequality and has depressed the real wages of many low education workers, as you can see from the fact that many of these dots, especially for the red and the green low education groups, are actually below zero. Real wage declines. Now, this is all pre-AI, but AI is here. Since, 19, uh, since 2015, there has been rapid spread of AI. This is from another paper I have with Pascual Restrepo, David Otter, and Joe Hazel. And AI, in principle, could do many things. It could create new tasks. And I'll come back to this in the context of how we can imagine a better uh, future with AI in two minutes. But this new tasks, complementing humans, facilitating matchmaking, these are very, very important aspects. And if you look at history, they've been important drivers of wage growth. But our work shows that AI until now, over the last seven years or so, has not been put to this. If you look at what are the establishments that adopt AI, they are uniformly those that have a lot of simple, routine, clerical type tasks that can be replaced. And we use several measures to do this, but in all cases, it's this blue and the uh, green groups that are driving the AI growth, and those are the ones that have these replaceable tasks. And what happens? Those blue and green groups stop hiring. Again, you see the effects of displacement. Now, I have also argued in other work, this is excessive automation meaning that this is not just a path of technology that's imposed on us by scientific progress or the only feasible, rational path for the U.S. and the Western Europe to follow. In fact, first, the lack of countervailing power from labor movement that in the past played an important role in encouraging how technology was used and growing dominance of the business models and size of big tech has been sort of critical for this. Excessive focus on cost cutting, it's also been a major reason for this, again, related to the shifting balance between capital and labor. And U.S. and European tax code, the same is true in the U.K., not to the same extent, powerfully favors capital. 
So if you look at marginal taxes on labor in the U.S., they're about 25 percent. Capital always gets taxed less, but especially software and equipment are now taxed about 5 percent, much bigger, much, much more favorable terms. So you actually, as a company, you save money by automating. A better future is possible. And my argument, especially in a forthcoming book with Simon Johnson, is that even the whole sort of framing of machine intelligence AI is wrong. What we should be talking about is machine usefulness. How can machines be useful to humans? Human skills are quite diverse. AI and other digital technologies can be helpful to humans, but if they try to replace humans, they are often uh, in this uh, sorry land of so-so automation. And often, you know, these digital technologies can be used as rent-shifting activities. They do not boost productivity, but they enable employers to grab, uh, grab money, rents, claw back high wages back from workers. For example, the monitoring use of AI is one illustration of this. I would add, it's a final slide, that machine usefulness, well, actually final two slides, machine usefulness has been quite useful, forgive the pun, in the past when it was tried. Pioneers of this approach, people like Norbert Wiener, Douglas Engelbart, J.C.R. Licklider, not only articulated sort of uh, an engineering and philosophical framework for thinking about use, machine usefulness, but uh, if, for example, Engelbart was at the forefront of inventing some of the most important digital tools that uh, are still used today, hypertext, uh, the mouse, obviously. Uh, and, and there are many other applications today. Uh, I can talk about them in Q&A. But the important thing is that's, what, that's not where the dollars are going. The dollars are going in AI and general intelligence, uh, which is uh, sort of a, a, a useless activity at some level, but also a huge amount of data collection, monitoring, and automation-related things. This is not just relevant for US, UK, European workers. It has huge implications for developing world. Another important argument uh, I have tried to make in the past is that AI and general automation technologies are inappropriate technologies for the developing world. They economize on the factors that are abundant in the developing world, leveraging factors that are skill scarce in those places. So let me conclude. The future of work could be good or bad in the same way that automation could be good or bad. Good automation is high productivity and is complemented by new tasks for labor. It empowers labor rather than disempowering it. But the problem is right now, we are going more and more in the bad automation direction. I'll be more than happy in the Q&A to talk about more specific policy ideas that can leverage this better automation, better use of AI for better work aspects. Thank you. Darren, thanks very much. So um, thank you for that really nice framing of the issue uh, where there's the potential to uh, bring in AI and automation in a way that's positive, but e equally it, it can be uh, well, as, as Darren describes, excessive focus on cost cutting, and that doesn't yield good work. Um, I'm going to pass to Kirsty now. Fabulous. Um, happy Thursday, everybody. Um, <laughs> I'm here in my tartan. Um, uh, I mean, I do sometimes wear tartan dresses anyway, but I specifically put this one on today. Um, Jim's absolutely right. I'm an MP for Aberdeen. I like to claim the whole city. My colleagues are not so keen on that, but. Um, I, I don't know if anybody's told you that Aberdeen is the centre of the earth. <laughs> um, so, I mean, they literally pay me to say that. Um, but I, I want to talk a bit about Aberdeen. I want to talk a bit about some of the things that we're doing in Aberdeen and, and you know, how this is relevant. Um, some of this is relevant because of the transitions that our city has seen. Our city has been at the forefront of technological transition already. Our city is now at the forefront of the next technological transition. We went from somewhere that was heavily reliant on fishing to being somewhere that is the oil and gas capital of Europe. You know, that change happened within our city. And I don't think we did it very well. I don't think we capitalised on it in the way that we could. I don't think we um, did it in a way that protected workers, that ensured that we had fair work, that ensured that well-being was um, put at the centre of what we were doing. Um, and, and there's always the risk that in the next technological transition, as we're moving away from oil and gas, as we're moving into, you know, finding new home, new routes for Aberdeen, finding new homes for all of our incredibly um, skilled workers, we need to make sure that we do that right 
as well. We need to, we have got the opportunity to plan a transition here in a way that we have never had before. Some of the stuff that happened in the past, you know, the, with coal mines, for example, there was no planning involved. It just sort of happened and then some decisions were taken, but there wasn't a kind of plan. This is, this is how it's going to work. These are the steps along the way and this is what we're going to replace it with. Um, so we've got the opportunity to make plans here. Um, some of the things that we're doing in Aberdeen, we're, we're, doing, we're working on just transition. And just transition is a phrase that actually came from uh, people that work within the oil and gas industry. Um, and it came, some, some of the stuff in the working together in the oil and gas industry is really interesting. You've got some people who go offshore to rigs who are, you know, overwhelmingly male, um, overwhelmingly pretty manly men that are, you know, um, go out drinking and uh, not everybody, but, you know, there, there is a kind of um, a, a laddish culture in some of that. You've got these folk in this laddish culture working together with people in Greenpeace to come up with plans for a just transition to come up with what does this look like you know what does what do our jobs look like where do we go you've got that that people with that shared interest that you would never ever have put together in the same box actually pulling in the same direction here and doing the same um doing the same work together and that's how we got the phrase just transition that's how we got into this this situation where what we're thinking about is Trans transitioning away from oil and gas to new technologies, transitioning away from you know the, the energy mix that we use, transitioning away to the jobs that are heavily reliant <coughs> on that. Um, but we want to do it in a just way. We want to do it in a fair way. We want to do it in a way that makes sure that everybody is included in this um, and that the societies and the communities that have been impacted or that are going to be impacted have got their say, have got the ability to say, no, this is what works for us, or this isn't what works for us, or this is how we see the future. Um, and, and one of the things in relation to this is, during the course of the last transition in Aberdeen, during the course of the rise of oil and gas, we went from a city where, you know, people didn't have very much money, right? Nobody really had very much money, to a city of haves and have-nots, to a city where if you work in oil and gas, particularly if you're working in oil and gas in the run up to 2015, 16, when the oil price crashed, you were making mega bucks, right? You were making lots and lots of money. I know so many people, such a significant proportion of my constituents, where the guy goes off to work offshore and the woman doesn't work. She stays at home and looks after the kids because the, 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 uh, there's affordability there. They'll be able to afford to do that because the guy is making so much money. I mean, it's a pretty crappy lifestyle, to be honest, because you're offshore, um, you know, two weeks and back on two weeks. And now it's three and three, um, you, you know, so it's, it's not brilliant. Um, but those choices have been made because people are making incredible salaries. For those people who are not making those incredible salaries, for those people that don't work in the sought after oil and gas jobs, your rents have been pushed up. Your prices of property has been pushed up. Your prices in shops even has been pushed up. Everything is more expensive. So if you're not on that kind of crest of that wave, <coughs> you have a worse quality of life. Now, one of my key things about thinking about the just transition is to make sure that we are not just finding jobs for all of these guys in oil and gas. Right? We need to make sure that the just transition is truly just in that it helps all of our communities. It helps these people that haven't had the opportunity to, um, to benefit as a result of oil and gas in Aberdeen. It helps everybody. And we can only do that by listening to the communities. I think that is a, an absolutely key thing. Um, but we can only do that by doing things in an organization-wide way for businesses and in a society-wide way. We're not going to we're not going to make a positive difference in Aberdeen if we switch everybody that's working in an oil and gas company to be working in an energy company, but everybody continues to be on the same pay scales. The cleaners continue to be paid pennies for what they are doing, despite, you know, that, that, that doesn't work. You need to level up everybody. Sorry to use that phrase. Um, you, need to, you need to level up everybody or it isn't a fair transition. And if we can reduce inequality when we're doing this, then that's great. In terms of levers, I'm aware that I'm kind of pushing on time. In terms of the levers that we have, um, I think the, the interesting thing mentioned about tax was really helpful. You know, um, I don't think politicians necessarily think about all of the tax implications of everything that they do. They think, right, we can get more tax by doing this. Um, but I, 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 I don't think generally that the tax system has been capitalised on enough in order to push businesses to do what we want them to do, in order to push them to, for example, invest um, more heavily in improving um, the, the 
infrastructure in their business, improving all of the tech that they've got, um, rather than giving dividends to shareholders. You know, we should be incentivizing that long-term investment um, rather than um, incentivizing you know a quick win and making a quick buck. In terms of the other um, stuff around um, other things that we can do, government has got control over wages. Right, we've got control over the national minimum wage. Um, there, there is the ability to change that. There is the ability to change terms and conditions. And one of the things that I've been on the APPG for corporate governance, and one of the things that I'm really keen on, is to improve transparency in company reporting. Right, we we are not, you know, and and some of the stuff that we're talking about about transitions is is worldwide. We have not yet got a situation where a clothing seller in the UK, a retailer that sells clothing in the UK has to honestly tell you whether or not they are using slave labor, whether you, they're using child labor in their corporate reporting. There is a measure of corporate reporting, but it's not, it's, not, it's not sufficient. It is not doing the job that it should do in terms of that transparency. And if we want to see that change, if we want to see everybody um, being uh, leveled up um, as a result of this transition, we need to make sure that we're thinking in everything that we do and using those levers in everything that we do to try and improve well-being across the board, not just well-being for a select few at the top. Thank you, Kirsty. So that, there's a, quite a strong theme of inequality coming through and a number of kind of nuances um, to this, but it's, um, it's nice to hear your thoughts on specific levers uh, that we may have uh, to work on this. So let's finish the, the round uh, with John. I'll hand over to you. Yeah, thanks very much, Naomi. <laughs> thanks to the Institute for inviting me back. I think it's nice to see some some faces from the Commission on the Future of Work, uh, yourself and Chris and Jim and others here. So uh, it's like a kind of a, a reunion gig, you know, it's quite, uh, it's quite nice. But I thought I'd just really um, reflect on some of the things which has already been said from my perspective, which was I was for my um, last few years uh, until I've gone into retirement was representing trade unions in the, in the OECD countries and trying to look at comparative um, comparative developments and um, a lot of the issues which were really burning I think came up in the panels we had this morning particularly in the one on the, the quality of work so I was just going to try and reflect um, now and then looking forward to discussion on you know where does that take us in a policy direction uh, not just for governments but for institutions and particularly for for unions um, I mean, I think the starting point, I mean, it's great that we're in the, in the Turing room here, but um, uh, it was Alan Kay, I think, who won the Turing Prize about 20 years ago, who said that um, the best way to shape, uh, to uh, predict the future is to shape it. And I, mean, I think it's exactly that. And I, and I think, you know, um, uh, Darren's sort of presentation as well is, what are the sort of levers that you can get off a, a technological uh, trajectory which is, um, has problems into one which starts to look much more, if not exactly a utopia, at least not a, a dystopia. Um, and the, I think the good news to some extent is that, uh, I mean, I've, in interfacing with the OECD, which I suppose you could sum up as sort of in the models of capitalism debate, was always trying to say what was the model that was winning at a particular point in time. You know? So in the, um, in the first job strategies which were produced in the 90s, it was, it was very much let markets rip and you know, this will sort it out and uh, you know, free markets will solve issues. There was a reiteration um, in, the, uh, in 2008, which was really saying, um, yeah, but market sure, but we, we've got to have Swedish labour market policies which will kind of help train people and get things to work. The one which came out just, um, just as I was, I was retiring, uh, the latest job strategy in, in 2017-18, um, was on the future of work, was very much about the quality of work. You know, let's just stop thinking only about the quantitative aspect and think very much about what does a strategy for decent good work in the future look like and what are the implications of that down the road. So on a positive note, to the extent that that sets an agenda somewhat, you know, I mean, maybe the main challenge here, and I was encouraged by the discussion this morning, is you know, how do you take that objective, if that is objective, and then get a strategy nationwide um, in the UK to try to get behind it and develop it. Um, 
and there's always obviously a danger as you know you can pick bits of different models and end up with a, a German bit or a Swedish bit or so on. But I think there are some lessons of looking abroad and thinking what has worked. Um, so one priority which came out, which we were discussing and has just come up about the question of change, and, and Kirsty, you've been discussing that you know, very pertinently about, about getting to um, zero emissions into 2050. But how do you give workers security in the change process? Um, so it's not just an economy where you're going to be put on a rubbish dump, we'll get some more workers in and maybe you'll get some, you'll get some benefits to cover it, uh, which then you see the destruction of communities behind that. And so the extent to which that is not an issue when I would go to, to, to Nordic countries and discuss with Swedish unions, sure, we need more technology, but we have a, a change council, we can have security councils with tripartite processes which try to identify, A, where the real risks are, and B, how can you deal with that in a strategic way. Uh, that's a long, long way. You know, I was old enough to work at the TUC in the 70s and deal with a, the National Economic Development Corporation and NEDI and so on. Um, even then, it was not really doing, doing that. Uh, but I think that whole process of how you get back to some collective effort between institutions to, to look, at, look at a strategy is important. Um, a second one, we've had a lot of discussion around pay, but um, again, you know, if, if, if most of my uh, former colleagues in, 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 in British trade unions, uh, if I go and talk to them now about artificial intelligence, they're kind of looking at... <laughs> You know, how do I get on the picket line at the moment, or how do we get off the picket line more appropriately? But, I mean, you, the current cost of living crisis, is, I mean, the UK was one of the ten of the four G20 countries that since 2009 have now pay, average pay, which is lower than it was in 2009. So it's come, the cost of living crisis has come on that. And then when that's pushed, obviously, the differential between different groups differential between high and low income payers, difference now as we're seeing in public and private sector. You can see why people are just being pushed over into a real state of crisis. Um, so the, the question of how to sort of relink pay and deal with that, um, I think is a crucial question. Um, um, uh, Dar Darren referred to the, the weakening of unions in the States. I mean, the, the IMF actually came out and said they reckoned that, you know, three quarters of the rise in, uh, in inequality um, essentially of the last 30 years has been due to actually the, the weakening of institutions, weakening of unions, particularly collective bargaining to deal with that. So at what point does the UK move to um, you know, thinking, well, unions are a bit of an embarrassment, let's not talk about it, to say, well, maybe we need a collective bargaining system back in place where we can start to link pay and productivity again. I mean, it's not terribly radical, or in those sectors, or for groups of gig workers and elsewhere, may we, it's very hard to organise, there is organising going on, may we need to think again about what were the objectives of some of the wages councils and wages boards at one point, which allowed a, a fair wage to be negotiated on behalf of groups of workers, which structurally very difficult to get into jobs. Um, I'll move on quickly, but a couple, of, a couple of other points of some of the things which came up. Um, Maybe this is a real big research area for the, for the Institute here, but I think we've got to get inside the black box of the firm and the workplace about technological change and how that happens. I was really struck by some of the knowledge around the, in the room this morning about looking at you know, job design, work organisation issues um, against the background of you know, fairly well-known indices of what, what looks like a, a, a good job. I suppose the question is how do you, in, in the complexity of technologies like AI um, being introduced, how do you begin to open up a space for worker voice negotiation, discussion on the issues which are coming up? And I go back just anecdotally to um, when I was doing some of the work on the, these, the, these things back in the, in the 80s, doing a study on looking at the Norwegian... Um, data shop stewards and the resources they used to have for negotiating technological change. And it's absolutely fascinating going to some of these pulp and paper mills and elsewhere, electricity, um, utilities and so on, um, in, in the dark winter, you know. Um, but you'd meet sometimes, you know, the, the uh, in those days, computer experts who were paid for by the company to actually give advice to the unions how to negotiate the change process that the company is putting on the table. 
And I said to, I said to one of the, the managers, the senior managers of the, one of the companies, I said, well, you know, I, coming from a UK perspective, I'm maybe not getting this right. So you're paying for somebody to come in and advise the union on how to rubbish your proposals. And uh, he said, yes, yes. Um, and um, I said, well, why do you do it? He said, well, look, we don't have much time. You know, I don't want to be having arguments about issues where there is an easy technological solution or something you can resolve. I want to know where the real conflicts are. So I don't want to be having false arguments, false negotiations. We don't have time for that. Just a little example where I think there are, if there's a different mindset, some win-win opportunities, you can look at facilities for doing that. A couple of other um, points on opening up, the, well, no, one other point on opening up the firm, and then I'll try to, to, to move on. But um, again, you know, Chris had the idea of how, you know, could you get boards more involved in this and broadening the ESG agenda in um, investment and so on. And um, I was sort of involved for many years. I was on the board of the Global Reporting Initiative trying to do a bit of that. But I suppose... I'm not sceptical, but I just say at some point you have to have, and some of this stuff is really about power relationships within organisations and where the power comes from. And I was really struck, again, I was on a, for a few years on a, a company which I was stay silent about, but was um, on their multi-stakeholder account, which was, again, trying to have a discussion with, uh, with stakeholders inside and outside the company on, on, on managing change. And um, we were looking, there were, primarily around issues of supply chain management and human rights down the supply chain, which was then becoming an issue uh, 10, 15 years ago. Still is, obviously. But the, um, we, we have this very nice... They had this very nice company policy about how they had to interject along the supply chain, ensuring there was no slave labour, there was no you know, responsible sourcing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and respect for, for local rights and so on. And... Um, they, they were pulling in uh, line managers from different countries around the world. And they all said, look, you know, when I come to headquarters, you know, nobody ever asks me, what are you doing about human rights in this place or that place or that place or really trying to make sure the workers feel engaged in, in Sri Lanka or somewhere? They say, you know, you've lost money on this last sort of six months project. You know, how are you going to cut costs? And they say, then, you know, then we brought in the company lawyers. They say, well, we advise, you know, our people not to discuss any of this in case we have a class action case in the States against us, you know. So there was this sort of, I'm not sort of denying the company was genuinely trying to have that conversation. Well, we did get pulled into a board meeting when they had an enormous strike about outsourcing and sort of everything hit the fan, you know. So they were saying, well, you know, we're saying, why didn't you discuss this before, not after? But again, I think some solutions with a different mind, you know, frame of mind which could work. Last point about, about um, skills and um, a lot of talk you know, this morning. And, and Michael Sandel you know, is also on the commission, I think has some very valid points about you know, Brexit and education and skills and problems with elites. But I would just sort of finish there by saying, you know, really reinforce that issue about getting away from this elitist, automatically university training education to thinking and I mean I guess you know the people who've done it well have been parts of German industry of basically getting skilled manual semi-skilled manual workers in the past into using technology and being aware of technology to enhance jobs producing much better products as well as actually better work situation and then linking that to a collective bargaining system which recognizes those work-based skills and knowledge and I think the danger of hire and fire, you know, get rid of this lot of workers, get some outside expertise in, fix the problem through a technological solution. I would say it's the only part of Britain's productivity problem which is missing. There's been a lot talked as well this morning about investment. But I think it's certainly part of that. So getting that soft technology, soft investment into the picture. And I just finish on what Kirsty was saying. It's great you mentioning transition and climate change because... You know, we've had one big shot from the pandemic where lots of things have happened very quickly. If we want to be optimistic, you know, with the energy price changes and now, you know, uh, zero carbon, we're having another massive shock which is taking place and probably necessary to shift to a different forms of production on energy use. And doing that without thinking, you know, workers leave their brains behind when they come into the plant in the morning... Um, I think is a, is a recipe for disaster. We have to engage 
and actually involve those, those, those voices in this process in a really serious way. Thank you, John. And so um, there's some quite practical thoughts on um, things we could do, including collective bargaining, which I would absolutely have expected from you, but um, a number of other things around <laughs> just transit. I don't totally agree with that. <laughs> so, um, so thank you for that. I, I'm going to throw a question back to Darren. There's a lot of questions on Slido. Do vote for the ones you like the most because it makes it easier for me to pick them. Um, but just first of all, Darren, I wanted to ask you, uh, Kirsty mentioned a couple of levers, policy levers, including sort of tax policies for the long term uh, as well as transparency in company reporting. I just wondered um, what, what your thoughts were on levers that um, could be pulled to, uh, it, to get the, the right kind of automation in and uh, to keep companies honest. Well, uh, thank you, Naomi, and thanks, Christy and uh, uh, John, for those excellent remarks that I see as very complimentary. Uh, so let me give that a multi-layered answer. I'm just going to interrupt you, Darren. Could we have Darren's picture on screen, please? We like to see you. Do you understand? <laughs> <laughs> Do carry on. I'm, I'm optimistic you'll appear at some point. He's we now can hear the, you anyway. He's now on the beach. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I was just putting my pajamas on. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think if, if I am, you know, my work with Pascual Restrepo and others work on this is right that automation and technology is an important part of both the inequality puzzle and the and also part of an, a, a helper for creating a better future of work, then we have to find ways of involving a broader part of society in technology choices. Just a few companies and a few engineers and business people with the same background, the same vision, controlling the future of technology is very dystopic. But how do you do that? I think that is a very, very important part of the conversation. I don't think, I don't know what's the best way of doing it. Certainly the labor movement has to play a role. Democratic processes have to play a role. A more diverse and ethical approach towards AI and digital technologies within the research and academic community has to play a role. But all of these are more like pie in the sky than, than reality. Then there are more sort of uh, practical policies that we can adopt. But I see them as complements, not as substitutes to getting a broader society-based approach to technology. And the reason for that is because if all we try to do is you know, delegate some bureaucrats in the government to try to fix the direction of technology, that's another recipe for disaster. So, uh, but, but I think uh, practically, we can start by leveling the playing field in the taxation of capital and labor. Uh, there, there, there are some arguments in economics that low taxes on capital are desirable. I do think those are generally based on faulty reasoning. Uh, there is a debate on this, but I think the the way that capital and labor are treated in many Western European nations, and especially in the U.S., is very jarring and and, and has to be sort of uh, changed. I also think there are reasons for thinking that the governments can play a more proactive role in encouraging. Uh, technologies that are more worker friendly. Some of that can take the form of regulations, for example, uh, workplace regulation, what extent of monitoring and other sort of uh, technologically motivated uses of employer power are allowed and are not allowed. And some of it may take place uh, at the more R&D level, sort of ways of encouraging better, more worker complementary uses of technology. I think the labor movement has to play in a very important role in supporting these. But differently from John, perhaps, I think that needs to be a very different labor movement than what we had in the uh, in the past, in the US and the UK, I think. Uh, I agree wholeheartedly with John that the German and the Swedish cases are more hopeful 
But I think what they achieve is via more sectoral agreements and more workplace-based communication. And I think that's been very difficult to achieve in the U.S. Uh, there's some very fascinating but depressing research showing the extent of conflictual relations between employers and employees, managers and employees in the U.S. And and the problem is much of that union movement was sort of centered on manufacturing. So expanding it to the non-manufacturing sector, I think, may require new organizational forms. I think those are some of the very important questions that we have to explore. I don't have the answers, but I think, uh, you know, a few snippets are very helpful, exactly like John said. German companies have sometimes been very good at using technology to empower workers, and work councils have played a role. But it's it's not uniform, and there are a lot of challenges, I think, in exporting that model to the U.S. or the U.K. Thank you. Thank you, Darren. Um, if you see me using my phone, I'm not texting my mum. I'm... <laughs> I'm using Slido, just so you know. Um, your mum should be devastated that you're not taking it. I'll, I'll take a photo for her in a minute. Um, so um, the top question um, is, uh, it, and it follows on from what Darren was saying, actually, is uh, to John, um, what are your thoughts on how the trade unions need to evolve um, to, to respond to the kinds of things that Darren was saying, a kind of different model from what we've seen in the past for the kind of non-manufacturing or even gig worker sector? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, there's, there's experimentation going on quite a lot. Some is that, is that from, from below, I mean, including, you know, in the States with organisations of beginning to form up of, of um, gig workers themselves. Uh, here. I think it's inevitably, it's very difficult to, you know, when you've got, it's, it, I would say it's easy, but it's obviously easier to, to organise large plants, um, large numbers of workers in the same area, you negotiate with a, an employee, you get a uh, procedural agreement which gives you certain rights and so on. And clearly, part of the model, part of the collapse of that model in you know since the 80s is, is that structural change. Part of it was also the fact that, along with the rise in inequality, there was a deliberate government policy in several countries, including the United States and and and, and the UK to say, let's just break all this up, let's get rid of unions. And, uh, and so hence you end up with the mishmash that you have in the private, in the private sector now. Um, I think the, the, the question now, and, and today it's quite interesting in the UK, there's the first strike of an Amazon warehouse um, you know, in, the, in the UK, which for the sort of epitome of surveillance capitalism, <laughs> I think is quite a good sign. The workers basically said, okay, that's enough, and that's supported by the unions to do. Um, but the the issue becomes how do you how do you size up new forms of organising in different different areas? You've got small groups of workers into something which fits into something which has a, an economy wide impact. And there may be some sectors where you've just got to take a, a type of works council model there, but you have to have the the, the broader growth in it. I mean, I think there are some lessons back in the, in the 60s and 70s. Uh, you know, the growth of white-collar unionism in the UK was a major, major source of growth. Now, obviously, mass unionisation is very much concentrated in the public sector. We're seeing that, to some extent, that reaction now of some very real industrial issues. But I think that question of experimentation, seeing what works, is important. But I suppose the basic point, it's very hard to gross that up into, um, let's say, high coverage rates of collective bargaining without also a top-down approach that becomes seen by institutions, by governments, by employers, that this is something which is desirable and probably useful in the term. So I think that, if you like, ideological battle in some ways of, you know, where is power and does it make more sense to try to sort of do deals and get something which works in the long term? Is still something, particularly in the UK, which you know, which has to be has to, has to be one. Thank you. I mean, we pretty much need a different government. <laughs> I mean, I'm allowed to say that, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but that's but that's what it comes down to. There needs to be a situation where the government is willing to. Well, yeah. I mean, well. I think you know, France, you know, um, France O'Grady and Richie Sunak cooperated on the, you know, the whole the whole of the COVID issues. So, 
you know, theoretically in the current situation in the UK, you could imagine trying to do a deal, get these things fixed, then work onto a positive agenda in the longer term would be sensible. But whether a large part of the support in Parliament from the current government would uh, want to go in that direction, I doubt. So, yeah. so Kirsty, there's something I wanted to, well, there are two things I wanted to ask you. One was reflecting on something Darren said about sort of practical policies being great, but we, we need to find a way of kind of getting society engaged as well. And so I'm, I'm interested just from the, the story you told about Aberdeen specifically, where it sounds like you did that, I'm interested in kind of your thoughts on that. Uh, and then more broadly, how you think we can translate what sounds like a really great activity in Aberdeen to the wider UK, or whether you think it, it always has to be a kind of local initiative. So in terms of the kind of engagement, um, you know, this is the biggest issue for Aberdeen, right? And in fact, climate change is the biggest issue for the entire world, but how it specifically impacts us and our workers in the city is the key thing that an awful lot of people are thinking about. Um, we've done things like, um, and a, a huge amount of it has been done by third sector organisations, a huge amount of it has been done by think tanks, by um, the Just Transition Commission, which was appointed by the Scottish Government, a huge amount of it has been done by that. We've done things like citizens' panels, We've got out there and we've spoken to people and actually, you know, said, what do you think? How do you think this is going to work? And come back with the results of that. We've done participatory budgeting in a huge amount of the kind of some of the just transition money that's been um, allocated locally has been done on the basis of participatory budgeting. So what do you guys think? we should spend this money on. These are the bids that we have. Which do you think are the best ones to go forward? Um, and, uh, you know, uh, some of that is harnessing, actually, the power of uh, the amount of people that started volunteering and things during the course of the pandemic. We need to not lose that. You know, we need to you know, have, because people were able to do so many cool things, so many helpful things during the course of the pandemic, we need to not suddenly wrap that all up in red tape and say, no, you can't do that. Sorry, your enthusiasm can just go back in its box now. Um, so we need to make sure that we're harnessing that as well. In terms of translating it up in terms of making that a wider thing we need to be serious about it and we need to demonstrate progress we need to demonstrate that we can make a difference so and this is going to sound completely irrelevant for a slight moment and um, i was a looked after children's champion in aberdeen um, years and years ago um, and we'd looked after children come to us and talk to us about some of the issues that they saw um, and one of the things that they asked for was they asked for better wi-fi right in the in the um, place that they were living and that is like a really, really reasonable ask. And we hit all of these barriers with BT or whoever it was that were unwilling to do it. But the kids didn't want to speak to us anymore, right? Because we had said, yeah, that should be fairly easy to sort and we'd failed to sort it. We hadn't demonstrated actually that we would follow through. So what was the point in them engaging? What was the point in them getting involved and coming to us with our ideas? So not just in a kind of UK wide basis, but you know, within companies and businesses, we need to make sure that that's being demonstrated, that those changes are being made, particularly when it's something that's small and easy to do, right? Just do it. Um, and then, you know, you're more likely to have people come forward with with um, what they want to do. But we need to listen. We need to make sure that government is listening. We need to make sure that you guys who are experts who know what you're talking about are able to go in and speak to government, are able for people to hear your voices and see your research and actually take action um, on that. So I think we need to, at this moment, put our money where our mouth is, if you like. No point in just talking the talk. We need to walk the walk now. Thank you. That's um, pretty compelling. And I'm going to take the next most popular question, uh, which is a nice, straightforward one. And Darren, I'm going to ask you this, which is how do we promote good automation? And you presented some totally compelling data and slides on, on why good automation made sense. So um, from where you're sitting, you know, how, do, how do we actually, it seems like, how do we get that to trickle down? That was another one of the questions. Um, how do we get that to, to make the obvious conclusion? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, in the past, when you had better outcomes for labor from technology, there were some technical and social preconditions for it. Technical preconditions is that it's not just automation. I think automation has been going on for at least 250 years and will continue to go on, but it needs to be complemented with other things that make better use of labor. And chief among them is creating new tasks. If you look at some of the iconic technologies of the 20th century that were useful for labor, they involved creating new tasks in factories or in offices uh, that then boosted employment and wages. 
where did these come from? They came from first scientific and engineering knowledge being used appropriately. That requires more investment, especially by uh, public authorities to sort of encourage uh, sort of broader research agenda. Most companies that are established are not always at the forefront of introducing the new tasks because they are uh, quite often coupled with new products and the new approaches. So, so that public support for R&D research science is, is important and it's been declining in, in, in all around. Often when there is a uh, need for making better use of labor, it's been quite central. So uh, if you look at 19th century US, for example, uh, a major driver of this type of technological change was a belief that skilled labor was scarce and then you know employers had to make better use of unskilled labor in order to increase its productivity. Trade unions played an important role when sometimes they messed it up, but uh, there are iconic cases in which trade unions were at the forefront of encouraging companies to use new technologies to introduce new functions for workers, pay at high rates, train workers. So uh, a lot of the battles, for example, between United Auto Workers and GM and Ford uh, in the 1950s were about you know, how you're going to use the new technologies, uh, whether you're going to offer training programs for workers. And, uh, and I think there's also a general attitudinal issue of management. So if management sees labor as a pure cost to be cut, that creates a very strong tendency for automation. You know, for many companies, labor is 50%, 60% of their costs. And if, you know, your priority is to cut costs and you see labor as the most sort of uh, avoidable part of that total cost bundle, okay, go for it. You automate. And that's been, you know, what many managers have heard from their courses in business schools, make lean corporations, you know, uh, look after the interests of shareholders. So it's been sort of a feedback cycle. But I think successful companies are those that see their workers as resources, not as costs. And if you see them as key resources, then you have better incentives for uh, trying to make that resource work better improve its productivity, improve its knowledge, improve its autonomy. And uh, unfortunately, you know, again, some of the recent research I've done shows that many companies, especially in an environment in which, you know, shareholder values, uh, sort of uh, emphasis on cost cutting, often that coming from business schools, that's dominant. They've gone exactly in the wrong direction. They've gone exactly in the opposite direction. They don't uh, they don't pay high wages. They, in fact, cut wages to their workers uh, without much productivity improvements. So, so we need a more systemic change about how we're going to achieve this. And, and that's why, you know, very much along what Christy was talking about as well, getting input from society at large is a very important part of the issue. Thank you very much. And I know there's questions in the room and a zillion questions still online, but I'm under strict instructions to get this session finished on time. So, in fact, I am going to wind us up um, slightly later than promised. Uh, but thank you very much to the panel, to Darren, to Kirsty, and to John. And thank you all for the questions. Thank you. thank you very much. Sorry I couldn't be there in person.